Welcome back, hockey fans. And we are back with part two of our three-part series looking at the career of Dave Andrichuk. If you haven't checked out part one chronicling his first 11 seasons in the league, pretty much all of which were with the Sabres except for the half of the 11th season, which where he was traded to Toronto, and at long last had a taste of playoff success that eluded him in Buffalo, check it out now. But for a brief summary, Dave thrived after being traded to Toronto as his career year was split between both teams where he reached the 50 goal mark for the very first time. Going into the 1993-94 season, it would be Dave's first full season with the Leafs. And after their miracle run to the 1993 Conference Finals and making it all the way to Game 7, fan excitement in Toronto was at a fever pitch. As a matter of fact, Toronto sports culture was at a height of a fever pitch in general to say the least. The Toronto Blue Jays that October would win their second straight World Series after Joe Carter's infamous home run. Doug Gilmore, along with Jays star Roberto Alomar, were becoming demigods in the eyes of the Toronto community. They were engraved in the culture of the city. Also, the Leafs and Jays as a whole were all becoming Toronto pop culture icons. Dave was very well in the mix. And while he was beloved for most of his tenure in Buffalo, in Toronto to this day, it's a whole other ball game when you're a great athlete. And to top it off, the city just found out around this time that they'd be receiving an NBA franchise. The Toronto Raptors will be coming to town come 1995. And then there was the Argos, the team people care about the least in this town, and no matter how bad TSN or the CFL want to convince you otherwise. But anyway, Leafs Nation was buzzing as they got out to a great start, and oh my good, I mean great. Wait, I already said great. Uh, well, never mind. They won their first 10 games. Yes, 10 games to start the season. That would be an NHL record, by the way, that has only been tied once since, and the previous record was 8 shared by, get this, the 1934-35 Leafs and the 75-76 Sabres, the latter of which Dave's first NHL mentor and line mate, Gilbert Perrault, was a huge part of. Dave had 12 points in those games and was a plus 7 to boot, and Gilmore again was firing on all cylinders. However, the next 10 wouldn't be so kind as the Leafs would only win 3 games of that set, but Dave was staying hot with 15 points in those games. He was playing excellently with multiple two-point nights, as the Leafs picked things up again by late November. And on December 1st, 1993, in a game against division rival St. Louis, Dave scored the first three goals of the game, his first hat-trick as a Leaf, as the Leafs won 4-2, and were 18-5-4 and, and on fire. Not long after that, however, he had back-to-back -back three-point games in a loss against Winnipeg in a win over Calgary. Dave was carrying his momentum from the prior season over, at least power play led by Dave, and a healthy Wendell Clark was among the best in the league. And in January, the Leafs had an 11-game unbeaten streak where Dave had 21 points, including a 4-point night in a win over the Canucks. And yes, Dave looked like he was getting the recognition he deserved as he made it back to the NHL All-Star Game for the first time since 1990. And he was joined by fellow Leaf teammates Doug Gilmore and Felix Potvin. Dave had a goal and an assist in the All-Star Game. And yes, Dave reached the 50 goal mark for the second straight year. And on the final game of the season with 53 goals and 42 assists for 95 points, he had four assists in a road game against Chicago, tying his career high year from the prior year with 99 points. For the first time in Dave's career, he finished in the top 10 in league scoring, finishing tied for 9th. That year, the Leafs also traded Glenn Anderson to acquire speedy goal scorer and future Hall of Famer, veteran Mike Gartner. And the Leafs finished 43-29-12 and 12 for 98 points, just one point shy of the year prior. But this was the year of the playoff realignment where it was a top eight seed format, where the division leaders would take the top two seeds and the rest of the teams would be seeded accordingly. The Leafs finished third, and they'd be taking on the sixth seeded team, the Chicago Blackhawks, who were somewhat of a disappointment that year. We do have to say, however, they were still at a good record, but nonetheless, were below expectations. They had a very strong team, led by the prowess of Jeremy Roenick in scoring, along with Joe Murphy. He had two great defensive forwards, veterans Brent Sutter and Dirk Graham. A defensive core made up of Steve Smith, Eric Weinrich, all-star Gary Suter, and of course, two-time Norris Trophy winner, Chris Chelios. 
and in net, Eddie Balfour. The Hawks went through some tough losses, losing 12-year veteran Steve Larmer to the Rangers and Michel Goulet to a devastating career-ending injury. But they could still give the Leafs a lot to handle. Game 1 took place in front of a rabbit crowd at Maple Leaf Gardens. After last season run, the fans feel they can do it again and go even further, and the Leafs were out to play. They took the Hawks apart, and Potvin was great in net. Dave had a goal and an assist as did Gilmore, while defenseman Dmitry Mironov had three assists. A huge 5-1 win over the Hawks. Game 2 was Felix the Cat and the Eddie the Eagle show. Both goaltenders were incredible. So incredible, in fact, the game was scoreless until the end of regulation. And just over two minutes into the extra period, veteran defenseman Todd Gill scores the winner. The Leafs take a 2-0 series lead as we ship to the Windy City. In Game 3, Chicago's top stars finally woke up. They took a 3-0 lead with two goals from Tony Amani and another one from Murphy. However, by early in the second period, Elliot Berg and Miranov scored to tie the game. Amani gets the hatcher to give the Hawks the lead back, then scores a fourth in the third to make it 5-3. The Leafs get one back late and press Belfour, but they get nothing in return, and the Hawks are now in this thing. In Game 4, a game my father actually attended, in the first period, the Hawks got off to a hot start again, and this time it was Suter scoring the first two goals. But Gilmore scored a power play goal late in the first period, and Dave scores a power play marker late in the second, and it's 2-2 after two. Rob Pearson gives at least a lead, but Suter gets the hat trick, and we're off to overtime. And 123, and Ronick breaks out, and the Hawks have tied the series at two. Return to Game 5 at Toronto, the Leafs defense and checkers are outstanding. Potvin makes a stop only when he needs to as he's not facing too much action, but Balfour is bombarded and it's Mike Eastwood who scores the only goal of the game. Another playoff shutout from Potvin and the Leafs have the Hawks on the edge. For Game 6 in what would be the last game at the infamous Chicago Stadium, this time Hawks' great defense tightened up as did their checkers, and Potvin faced more action, but he was a wall. So much of fact that Mike Gardner, who had been quiet in these playoffs so far, scores the only goal of the game, and the Leafs take the series in six games. As their defense and grinders were outstanding, Potvin had three shutouts out of the four wins. Dave played pretty well in the series with two goals and three assists for five points and an even zero in six games. Oh, waiting the Leafs in the next round were the San Jose Sharks, a team nobody, almost literally nobody, well, hell, I'll even bet their own fans didn't even expect them to be there, that nobody expected them to be in the second round. Yes, in their third year of existence, they slipped into the playoffs, winning 33 games. They'd only won 28 combined in their first two seasons. But this isn't to say they didn't have a talented bunch, because they sure did. Including two Soviet legends, Igor Larionov and Sergei Makarov. They also had Todd Ellick, a young Ray Whitney, as well as Sandys Ozilinch leading the defense and in net, Latvian sensation, Artur's Urbe. They shocked the Red Wings in the opening round of a huge Game 7 upset, which I cover in my video regarding Paul Coffey's run with the Wings. Check it out. The Leafs, however, were still heavy favorites, and Game 1 was all set from Toronto. And Wendell scores early, but Lariano ties it several minutes later. Veteran Mike Osborne gives at least a 2-1 lead in the second, but Pat Falloon ties it as Irving and Hopman are fantastic in net. Time is running down to the third period, and the game is still tied. And with 2.16 left, Johan Garpenloff scores, and the Sharks hang on to win 3-2. The Leaf fans at Toronto Sports Media are stunned. However, the Leafs respond emphatically in Game 2. Gilmore, Wendell, Ellett, and Miranov play great games, and they tame the Sharks with a big 5-1 victory to tie the series. And now we're, we head to San Jose for the next three games. Yes, don't, don't ask. The 94 playoffs made very little sense in many ways. But regardless, Game 3, a, a game full of fighting and brawling, and the Leafs play terribly. Alf Dallin gets a hat trick. Tom Peterson had three assists. The Sharks win 5-2 and take a 2-1 series lead. Dave has not played well, and the Toronto Sports Media makes it known. He hasn't scored a single point yet in this series, and was a minus 2 in Game 3. But much like the year prior, went down 2-1 in the series, at least don't panic and respond huge. And so does Dave. Two goals and an assist for three points, and a five-point night from Gilmore, plus a huge game from Ellen. The Leafs humiliate the Sharks 8-3 to tie the series. 
But in Game 5, Davis nowhere to be found as Makarov and Lariatov are unstoppable. And the Sharks win 5-2 and now lead the series. And the Leafs are on the verge of elimination. A position they were never in last year until, well, those Game 7s pretty much. And again, those vicious leech suckers known as the Toronto Sports Media is targeting the team and Dave again. We head back to the next two games in Toronto. Again, don't ask. Wendell scores the only goal of the first. Larry off the only goal of the second. is tied 1-1 after two. Wendell scores early in the third, but Jeff Norton ties it shortly after. Neither team is giving an inch, and no one's taking a mile as we're headed to overtime. Leaf fans are on the edge of their seats as it's do or die. They could be the victim of another huge upset. But in the extra period, Mike Gartner scores as he's been pretty good in this series. And we're off to a seventh game. Oh yes, the Leafs faithful is out in full force, and so are the Leafs. They're in full control from the beginning to the end. It's another big game from Wendell. Potvin is outstanding in it. It's a 4-2 win for the Leafs. And despite suffering their biggest scare the previous two seasons, they are off to the conference finals for the second straight year. Dave didn't play overly well in this series, however, despite his performance in the important Game 4, where all his points came from in this series. He's not playing near as well as he's playoffs as he was last year. But that will all matter very little as they arrive in the conference finals. The Vancouver Canucks await them. Another team that was not expected to be there. While they had excellent regular seasons in the 91-92 and 92-93 regular seasons, they suffered consecutive second round exits to underdog teams. And while they had a winning record this season, they were a very far cry from the previous two. Yet, they had advanced to the conference finals for the first time since 1982. The team consisted of star 60 goal scoring forward, the Russian Rocket Pavel Bure. Alongside him, you had Captain Trevor Linden, Jacques Courtneau, Cliff Ronning, Martin the Eliminator Jelena, and veteran Murray Craven. A pretty solid defense made up of 14-year vet Dave Babich, Jeff Brown, Yerky Lume, and Brian Glynn. And backstopping them in net, the highly skilled Kirk McLean. And they were guided by the great Pat Quinn. In game one, after a scoreless first period, Dave strikes early on in the second period on the power play, but Babbage ties it. 38 seconds into the third, Leafs fan favorite Peter Zessel gets his first goal of the postseason. The clock is winding down. The Leafs are about to take game one, and oh no, 30 seconds to play. Linden ties it. We're off to OT. It's a throw right as Pop Van and McLean make some huge stops, but with 3-0-5 left in the extra frame, Zessel scores again. The Leafs take game one. Game 2 is an exciting one as well. The first period is almost scoreless again, but Bure scores late. Miranov, who has been great in these playoffs, scores two goals in the second and the Leafs lead. But Brown and Craven score just 36 seconds apart, and the Canucks suddenly lead 3-2 after 2. Elliott scores on a power play early in the third. The game is tied at 3 and the clock is winding down, but with 4-14 left, Lume scores, and the Canucks hang on to win. The series is tied as we ship to Vancouver for 3 games games. God, I don't think there's a playoff year I love and hate more than 1994. Thank you very much, Gary <laughs> Bettman. Yeah, in Game 3, Pat Quinn and the Canucks are playing with a new strategy of defensive coverage that has thrown the Leafs off in a huge way. And while they get to McLean, often he's turning away everything. Poffin is not. Shortly after Burray scores his second goal of the game to give the Canucks a 3-0 lead, the Leafs get frustrated and a brawl erupts, and Gilmore gets ejected, as does Rob Pearson, and Felix Poffin is about as dumb as the rest, as he takes a slashing penalty that gives the Canucks a power play, and Jelena scores an empty netter, an embarrassing spectacle from the Leafs. Game 4, cooler heads need to prevail, and indeed they do, as there's literally only two penalties the whole game. Hmm, glad they took my advice. But again, McLean is amazing in net, and the Leafs defense is doing their thing as well, and Potvin is turning away some tough shots. The third period is winding down. There's no score, but with 2.25 remaining, Cliff Ronning scores. The Canucks finally strike. And then the net is empty. Pavel Bure ices it. The Canucks win. The Leafs are down three games to one. The biggest deficit they faced in the last two seasons, and they've been shut out two games in a row by Kirk McLean. Oh man, game five, the Leafs need Dave. They need Gilmore, Wendell, and Gardner to really step up. And boy, do they ever! The first period, Gardner sets up Eastwood, his first point of the series, 1-0. Gilmore scores, it's 2-0. Wendell scores his first of the series, it's 3-0. Leafs at their one. David, however, is still nowhere to be found. The second period, 134 in, it's Craven, 3-1. Then it's 
Lafayette, 3 2. And late in the frame on the power play, it's Greg Adams, 3 3. Yes, the Leafs let that huge lead slip, but there's no scoring in the third period. And we're up to overtime. McLean and Potvin are a respective wall in their nets. And it's a throw ride. This is where Dave gets step up. But the first OT ticks down, and we're off to double OT. And the double OT starts 14 seconds in. Adams scores, and the Leafs season is over. Another dream season ends in heartbreak, and Dave does not play well. A goal and an assist and a minus three to sway another deep playoff run. This time, Dave was kind of dead most of the way through. However, this is more of a testament to how well the Canucks played in this particular series, as they shut the least top guns down completely, as Dave, Gilmore, Wendell, and Gardner just scored a combined 8 points in 5 games, half of which were Gilmore's, and were a combined minus 10. These are some insane numbers this year, however, as the monster duo of Big Dave and the Killer were on fire with Dave's career year yet again. Gilmore assists on 35 of Dave's 53 goals, all but 18. That's utterly insane. They also collaborated on 17 assists together to boot, and Dave assisted on 13 of Wendell's goals, as the two were an epic force on the power play. Dave also still clicked with Borchewski once again but he missed nearly 40 games due to injury, and he also worked well with star defenseman Dave Ellett. Despite his lackluster playoff showing, Dave had another banner year, finishing tied for ninth in league scoring, his first top 10 appearance, tying his career high in points, leading his team in goals for the fifth time in his career. He also was a career high plus 22. He played his second NHL All-Star game and was tied for six in power play goals, along with teammate Wendell Clark to boot, and again came up just short I'm making the NHL's year-end All-Star team voting, finishing third. The off-season, Dave faced much criticism from the Toronto sports media over his lack of presence in these playoffs, and while it wasn't his best outing, they still did win the first two series, and pretty much every Toronto forward was shut down in the conference finals. The 94-95 season, However, it would be stalled by a lockout, and come October, then November, then December, there were still no hockey. Finally, the issues were settled, and the season was set to get underway in late January, and would be a condensed 48-game schedule where teams would only play opponents from their conference. Dave was named alternate captain of the Leafs, and they also made a huge acquisition, feeling they were just a little too stacked with skilled finesse forwards, the Quebec Nordiques, that is felt they needed some power and strength, so they obtained Wendell Clark and gave up Matt Sundin. Either way, Leaf fans still had many high hopes as they felt maybe third time would be a charm. The Leafs were looking somewhat sluggish as a whole to start the season. At 4-4-2, Dave only had 8 points in those first 10 games. After 20 games, Dave had 13 points, kind of lackluster. But the team as a whole was slumping. Gilmore wasn't playing that well. Mike Garner seemed to be a waste of money even at this point, despite his reputation of being one of the most consistent forwards in the league for many years. In an interview, however, Dave gave to the Tampa Bay Times when something similar happened in 2013, with the season limited to 48 games, that is. He mentioned how everyone at this time was pretty out of shape and could barely make a pass, and said they were dropping like flies in the early portion of the season. Head coach Pat Burns was apparently managing players more than ever at this point, trying to get them going, because he knew in a short season you really can't afford a significant losing streak. Just one can ruin your playoff chances. If you actually watch any games from this ill-gotten season, and not just from the Leafs either, you can see that hockey is absolutely brutal in many games. After 20 games, the Leafs were 9-8-3. Good, not great. Dave slowly started to find his groove again as the season progressed, but the Leafs were very inconsistent. They couldn't find much more of a steady groove than three games, and did manage to obtain one four-game unbeaten streak in this season. They finished 21-19-8. Good enough for 50 points and good enough for 5th place in the conference. Their opponents in the first round were the same as last year, the Chicago Blackhawks, as they finished 3 points ahead of the Leafs, and have now added star forward Bernie Nichols to their club, and the man who was the face of the team for 10 years from 1980 to 90, future Hall of Famer Denny Savard, who had spent 3 seasons in Montreal and 2 in Tampa Bay during his time away. He brings a great deal of playoff experience to boot in the Leafs, I'm sure know this. And EA, the playoffs are back to normal series formats, hallelujah! Game 1 took place in Chicago, and the Leafs looked sharp. Dave scores a goal and an assist, while Sundin scores two goals, and Pop and his great net, the Leafs win 5-2. 
Game two, it's the Felix Potvin show again with 42 saves and not a single puck past him. And goals from Sandine Gartner and Mike Ridley. And the Leafs go home with a 2 0 series lead. Yes, the Leafs Nation is psyched for game three. Many are thinking sweep, sweep, sweep. Belfour and Potvin are still in this series. But late in the first period, Ridley scores on the power play. And nearly three minutes later, however, so does Gary Suter is tied 1 1. Early in the second period, Suter gets his second of the game. And in the third period, Chris Chelio scores a shorthanded goal at 3 1 Chicago. And with 58 seconds left in the game, Sundin scores at least they still have home, but it's not to be. Chicago hangs on, and they stay in this series. Game 4, Bell 4 is shining, and the Hawks have a 2-0 lead after two periods. But just under two minutes into the third, Sundin sets up McCowan, and the Leafs are still in this game. But they can't get anything else past Bell 4. The Hawks ice it with an empty netter. They have stunned the Leafs, taking both games on the road to tie this series. Neither team has won a home game. Game 5 back in Chicago, our hero has played well in the first two games, but quiet the last two. Chicago leads 2-0 until 49 seconds left in the second period. Sundin scores to close the gap. And then Gilmore sets a thief on the power play. Nearly three minutes into the third to tie the game. However, less than three minutes later, Joe Murphy scores and Marie Craven scores a late insurance worker. What the hell just happened? After taking two games on the road, the Leafs now find themselves on the verge of elimination. Game 6 is in Toronto and the fans still have faith. The Hawks score the only goal of the first period. Miranov, Domi, and Ridley all strike for the Leafs. It's 3-1. Yes, Randy Wood scores on the power play under a minute into the final period. 4-1 Toronto. Yes, they still stay off elimination. With very little... Oh, well, Savard scores just under two minutes later. But it's it's okay. The clock is winding. Popman is stopping all the pucks. And, uh, wait, 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 Joe Murphy. 7-11 to play. No, it's 4-3. Oh, okay. All they have to do is hang on. And we're going to... Overtime, uh, because playoff savvy Brent Sutter ties it with 4.37 to go. And in OT, exactly 10 minutes in. Oh, Randy Wood gets a second goal of the game. Maple Leaf Gardens loses it. We're going to game seven. Oh, yes, we are all set for the seventh game. And our hero ties the game late in the first period. Toronto goes on to <laughs> trail 4-1 to and end up losing 5-2. The least season ends in disappointment yet again. Oh boy, Dave would probably like to forget this one. He played well in the first two games, but disappeared as the series went on until the seventh game, which they still lost. Two goals, three assists for five points, but did finish a plus three. But that won't matter to the brain trust <laughs> that is the Toronto sports media. Dave finished the year with 22 goals and 16 assists for 38 points in 48 games this year, and he and Gilmore weren't clicking much that season. He did, however, find his groove with 10-year veteran Mike Ridley, who had joined the team that year, and assisted on almost half of Dave's goals, and even worked well with newcomer Matt Sundin as well, and defenseman Todd Gill. Dave's 38 points were still enough to finish second to Sundin in team scoring. He did manage eight power play goals, but the least power play took a nosedive as a whole. That could be attributed to Wendell Clark's departure. Dave also finished, however, a minus seven, the second worst mark of his career. It wasn't a good year, but even with that stat, we can't call it overly bad, however. The Leafs team as a whole seem to lose focus. It's simply just a forgettable season. Despite their disappointing season, hopes were still high for the Leafs going into 95-96. And NHL odds makers still had the Leafs as contenders going into the season. And they had made a huge deal in the offseason as on July 8, 1995, the Leafs took a gamble training arguably their best defenseman at that time, Dmitry Mironov and a fourth round draft pick to the Pittsburgh Penguins for season veteran and future Hall of Famer Larry Murphy. Murphy had 15 seasons under his belt and was still a very healthy player and at that point he was fourth all time among defensemen in scoring. He was also an all-star and had two Stanley Cup rings to his credit. Dave also was looking to find his full groove again and hoped that he and Gilmore could reignite their chemistry and that was on the mind of the Toronto fans and media. The Leafs did not get off to a very good start, to say the least. And Dave had 8 points in 10 games. He was a minus 5. And the team as a whole just seemingly wasn't clicking. The normally calm, cool, and collected GM Cliff Fletcher started panicking. But the Leafs would go unbeaten in 9 of their next 10. And Dave had 12 points in that stretch, including a 3-point night over the Washington Capitals. After that, though, Dave started struggling just a little bit. But at the halfway point of the season, the Leafs were 20-14-7 for 47 points. Looking pretty good. And Dave still had 31 points. Still good, even though it's not his usual numbers. But he went on a five-game scoreless slump. And this sort of thing that happens to him at times. 
but he was also an abysmal minus seven. The media boo birds and even Toronto fans were starting to turn against him. It would get worse as he'd go scoreless in eight of nine games not long after that. Not to mention the Leafs had plummeted down the standings and one point even going winless in 10 of 11 and then later going on an eight game losing streak, which turned into 10 games winless overall. The trade rumors were brewing and the rumors of Pat Burns' job as coach were also in jeopardy and that would come to fruition. He was fired and replaced by Nick Beverly. Since the new year, Cliff Fletcher had made six trades. On March 13, 1996, the Leafs hosted the Winnipeg Jets. Scoring machine Keith Kachuk opened the scoring, but Dave struck on the power play. But Mike Eastwood would give the Jets their lead back shortly after. With a minute to go in the period, Dave sets up Gilmore, who scores a tie it. The only goal in the second period comes off Dave's stick again on the power play. The Jets were tied early in the third and ended in a 3 3 tie. Dave perhaps played his best game all year for the Leafs and was named first star, getting a warmer reception from the Leaf fans that he'd gotten recently. It was a great night for our hero. And shortly after that game, he found out he was traded. Indeed, that very night, on March 13, 1996, Cliff Fletcher, who'd been a busy man, as he already produced a trade that day that brought Wendell Clark back to the team from the Islanders, he traded Dave for a pair of draft picks to the New Jersey Devils. Oh, saving the suspense, the draft picks never panned out. Huh. Nice one, Cliffy. Dave may not have been having a good year, but he was only 32 years old. He was staying healthy for the most part. And then Lamorello definitely played Fletcher like a fool on this one. And also something to point out that this was the era of the neutral zone trap system of defense. Also known not so fondly as the dead puck era. It was really taking shape. Some players adapted to it, yet a player of Dave's style, referring to others like him as well that is, had great difficulty. And it wasn't just them. It was highly skilled players racking up some 90 point to 100 point seasons who were swallowed by that system, and were just never able to fully readjust. But the team that perfected that system at this time was the New Jersey Devils. Dave's last days at Toronto consisted of 20 goals and 24 assists for 44 points in 61 games. The chemistry between he and Gilmore was a step up from last year, and he also clicked well with Sundin as well as Larry Murphy in those final days. With his 44 points in 61 games, it wasn't the best way to end his tenure in Toronto. And he was a career worst minus 11 at that point. And he was going to a team where the neutral zone trap system is king. Many wonder what Dave's role would be. He spent parts of four seasons with the Toronto Maple Leafs, including two full seasons. And even one of those wasn't really a full season. But regardless, he became popular instantly among fans. Finally made not one but two deep playoff runs, reached the 50 goal mark twice both for the first times in his career and had insane chemistry with Doug Gilmore. His time may have ended with a whimper, but in the 4-1-6, he is still remembered by fans of that era. The New Jersey Devils, I should mention, were also defending Stanley Cup champions. They shocked the Detroit Wind Rings in a four-game sweep the year prior. But they were incurring some struggles that season, and Dave was ready to join them as they were riding a night game at Beaton Street, however, at this time. And they were 31, 25, and 11 for 73 points, and were sitting in sixth place in the Eastern Conference and hoping to boost up the standings. And they practically had to give up nothing in return to receive Dave. Despite being a defensive minded team, they had some immense talent up front, such as Steve Thomas, Bill Guerin, veteran John McLean, Stefan Riche, Peter Sakura, Bob Carpenter, and Neil Broughton. But again, the core of their team was their defense, led of course by Captain Scott Stevens, Scott Niedermeyer, Gritty Ken Denico, Sean Chambers, and Dave's longtime Buffalo teammate. Phil Housley, who had also just recently arrived at the team. And in goal, they were backstopped by 30-year All-Star, Marty Brodeur. The problem was the Devils were one of the worst goal-scoring teams in the league, and perhaps they hoped that Dave, despite his struggles, could change that. He made his debut in a Devils uniform on March 15, 1996, as they hosted a shockingly good Tampa Bay Lightning team. But on this night, Brodeur was a wall, and Dave scores his first goal as a Devil, and then set up a Bobby Hull League goal later on, en route to a Devils 5-0 win. The team was now unbeaten in 10. The Devils, however, would lose three in a row. And in those three games, plus a win over the Isles, Dave was scoreless. He rebounded, however, with a two-assist game and a win over Tampa, and then two goals, tying the Blues right after. The Devils were struggling and went winless in four, but Dave helped them get a win over Hartford and scored two goals in the process, which brings us to April 7, 1996. The Devils were hosting their hated rivals, the New York Rangers. This game was important because the Devils were clinging onto their playoff spot, but Dave was on the verge of a huge milestone. 
It was 14-16 into the first period. Scott Stevens set up Dave to score on Mike Richter. And with that goal, Dave scores career point number 1,000. He had become the 46th player in NHL history at that point to reach the mark. But he was far from done. Just 2.14 later, he assisted on a Bill Guerin goal. And then 2.15 later, he and former Sabres teammate Phil Housley set up John McLean. The Devils go up 3-0 on the verge of a 4-2 win. However, the season wound down. The Devils found themselves on the verge of missing the playoffs. After a win over the Washington Capitals on April 11th, the Devils were tied with the Tampa Bay Lightning for points. But due to having less losses, that meant the Lightning were 8th and the Devils sat at 9th. After Tampa defeated the Rangers a day later, the Devils were out, becoming the first Stanley Cup champion since the 1969-70 Montreal Canadiens to miss the playoffs. Dave scored 8 goals and 5 assists with the Devils in 15 games for 13 points. He instantly found chemistry again with former teammate Phil Housley, as well as Randy McKay. Unfortunately for Dave, his presence on the Devils, despite the team having a winning record, and his contribution was not enough to get them in the playoffs. And for the first time since 1986-87, and only the third time in, in 14 seasons, he will not appear in the postseason. Before the trade to New Jersey, the Leafs didn't have a good record. They were 25-31-12, while the Devils were 31-25-11. The Leafs still had Sundin, averaging more than a point a game at that time. The Devils didn't have one forward doing so. After the trade, the Devils' scoring didn't improve with Dave's arrival despite him playing well, and Toronto actually kept improving under new coach Nick Beverly as the team as a whole brought it together to clinch a playoff spot. However, they would lose the St. Louis Blues in six games in the opening round. In 76 games, Dave had a grand total of 28 goals and 29 assists for 57 points, and he tied his career low with a minus 9, but he did score as a thousand career points and seemed to be fitting in with New Jersey. Going into the 1996-97 season, someone felt the neutral zone trap had been exposed to the Devils' inability to make the playoffs the year prior and the year after they won the Cup. Head coach Jacques Lemaire, however, wasted no time in making sure this team was once again the cream of the crop. But what would Davis' role be? Especially on a team like this, well, Lemaire clearly thought about it a lot, and Davis would be a huge part of that season. The Devils, however, were a team that wasn't going to score a lot of goals, but they were going to stop a lot of them. And but many thought this would be the reason why they'd be exposed even further. And it looked that way to start the season. They were 4-5-1. and one. Dave had three goals and three assists for six points. That was to be expected on a team like this. But the team later would improve as time went on. And Dave became a very threatening defensive forward as he was becoming one of the best in the league. As a matter of fact, his physicality was used on defense with an offensive input. Dave was turning into one of the best defensive forwards in the NHL. A Selkie candidate, pretty much. And he still had a three-point night, however, in a win over Boston on December 12, 1996. At the halfway point, the Devils were 21-15-5, with 47 points. They were looking a little better than last year. Dave had evolved into a great checker as well. Just when so many thought Dave's career was on the downswing, well, they were wrong. Lemaire found a way to work with him within the Devils' system. On February 25, 1997, however, another shocking turn of events would take place. The Devils made another big trade with Toronto, and Doug Gilmore would arrive in the Garden State. The Devils were dominating the opposition. The neutral zone trap was here to stay, like it or not. The Devils found themselves on top of the East by March 15, 1997, as they were ready to host a badly struggling Washington Capitals team. Gilmore actually scored the opening goal of the game, but just over 150 later, it happened. On the power play, no less. Lyle Odlon had fed the puck to Bill Guerin to set up Dave, and there it was, career goal number 500 becoming the 26th player in NHL history to reach the mark en route to a 3-2 Devils win. The season was winding down and the Devils had clinched first place already going into the final game of the year at the Philadelphia Flyers. During the game, Dave got tangled up behind the net with Flyers working defenseman Yanni Ninema and suffered a non-displaced fracture of his ankle. And Dave was looking at his best chance to be out in the Stanley Cup be out for at least a couple weeks. The Devils finished 45, 23, and 14. Best record in the East. Second best record in the whole league. Dave had a tremendous year where he should have been clearly in line for Selkie voting for best defensive forward. And while he was, he ended up coming in 11th? Can you f***ing believe that? He was one of the best defensive forwards in the NHL. He finished 
tied in third for a plus 38. That was a career high. He proved a lot of naysayers wrong with his season. Lemaire found a way to work with him to make sure that he is a key asset to this team. Oh, well, sadly, Dave wasn't going to play in the first round in which the Devils would play the upstart Montreal Canadiens. The Devils easily took the first three games but lost a thrilling triple overtime game in Game 3, but in Game 5, they would take it at home and move on to the second round. Dave was still unavailable as the Devils would face the New York Rangers, a team consisting of Brian Leach, all-star defenseman, goalie Mike Richter, legendary Mark Messier, as well as guys like Essa Tikkanen, Russ Courtnell, and Luke Robitaille, all veterans, and Hoing Gretzky. The teams exchanged back-to-back -back shutouts against each other to split the first two games in New Jersey to open it up. Game 3 saw a tight-knit competitive battle, but Mike Richter was ahead of the game as the Rangers won 3-2 and took a 2-1 series lead in Game 4. Richter was even better with a shutout, and the Devils' plan to return the big dance was, well, looked like it was being cut short. Dave returned to Game 5 at long last, and it's about time. And the goaltenders are worth a story. It's a 1-1 tie going into OT, but Adam Gray scores, and the Devils' season just like that is over. Dave's return didn't make a lick of difference, and you can't really call it his fault. The series was pretty much gone before he even came back. You have to wonder how things might have gone differently if he had been healthy. After a stint in Toronto brought him close twice, Dave could probably feel the cup ring on his finger at this point, but it was not to be. After now 15 seasons, the heartbreak continues. Dave worked well with the likes of Steve Thomas and others, but his biggest partnership was with hard-working defensive forward Bobby Holik, who made a clean sweep in terms of all these categories with Dave, and it's a shame we didn't see what they could do together in the playoffs. Dave had a tremendous year, one that gets overlooked, but I guess was tainted by his injury in playoff absence despite how well the Devils did as a whole. Now with 500 goals and 1,000 points in his career, his ticket to the Hall of Fame should be punched. He was third in the league in plus-minus, second on his team in scoring, and was on a team that he could likely win a championship with. With 15 seasons under his belt and a bad injury, it was somewhat of a curiosity to see how Dave would go in the 1997-98 season. He actually would stay healthy most of the season, only missing seven games. While his defensive prowess and checking was still present, his scoring did hit an all-time low. 14 goals and 34 assists for 48 points. He tied his career low in goals from his rookie season, but he was still a welcome presence and a great on-ice leader. He was also very popular among Devils fans. They were looking even stronger this season. Also, the Devils were the least penalized team in the league. That also helped very much, to say the least. They finished 48-23-11, and 11, 107 points and were a big Stanley Cup favorite. Dave would be healthy for the playoffs this time, as the team finished once again with the best record in the East, and second best in the league as our hero has another chance to be a champion. In the opening round, they faced the highly upstart Ottawa Senators, who spent their first four NHL seasons being the proverbial laughing stock of the league, but have built quite a bit of talent. A highly talented goaltending duo for one of Ron Tugnut and Damian Rhodes. A solid defense made up of Wade Redden, Igor Kravchuk, and Chris Phillips to name a few. Up front you had Sean McEachran, third year forward Daniel Alfredson, and superstar forward Alexei Yashin. In game one, Rhodes and Brodeur were amazing in that, but it was the Sens who led 1-0 in the third period, but with 3.24 to play, Gilmore scores! We're going to OT and just 5.58 in. I don't believe it, Bruce Gardner scores, and the Sens stun the Devils and the hockey world to take Game 1. Game 2, the Sens are up 1-0 early, but on the power play, it's Morrison to Gilmore to Dave. He scores, the game is tied. Gilmore continues his epic night, and the Devils win 3-1 and tie the series as we head to Ottawa. In Game 3, the Devils' defense is incredible, but as is Damian Rhodes and net for the Senators. The only goals in regulation were one apiece, scored by each team. However, we are off to overtime. And 2.47 in, Yashin scores. The Senators take a 2 one series lead. What is happening here? Oh, boy. Game 4, it don't look much better. Peterson did strike first for the Devils, but Daniel Alfredson's hat trick had to send up 4-1 in the third period. Goals from Stevens and Gilmore almost helped the comeback, but the Devils lost 4-3 and were on the verge of elimination. Oh, dearie, dreary. Game 5 is in New Jersey. It's another tight-knit close game. The Devils stay alive by Goody with a 3-1 win and force a sixth game, but are still on the verge of elimination as we head back to Ottawa. Game 6, however, the Sens complete the monster upsets by keeping the Devils in check. And the best team in the East, second best in the league, falls victim to a team winning their first playoff series ever. Dave just had nothing to give in this series. They didn't have much substance. It's just a goal and being a minus two. How could this happen? 
All those first round losses in Buffalo and those also close conference finals with the Leafs last year with a 100 point team and being injured and returning in time to lose. And then this year, the, the team having an even better record, I might add. And Dave is also healthy with these playoffs. They lose to a team they finished 24 points ahead of in the standings. Our poor hero. Dave had 14 goals and 34 assists for 48 points in 75 games. But what little he did score was assisted by his old Toronto partner in crime, Doug Gilmore, as he continues to gel well with Bobby Holik and Randy McKay. Despite some low numbers, Dave was still an important part of the Devils' strategy. He still accomplished a plus 19 and helped the Devils to a second straight 100-point season. But the playoff disappointment continues. As Dave was ready to enter his 17th NHL season, the Devils, well, they needed to make some changes. They had two back-to-back 100-point -back seasons, yes, and their tramp system was changing the game, for better or worse, depending on who you ask. But they needed to shake things up a bit. As a matter of fact, it was the end for Jacques Lemaire in New Jersey as a head coach. They also parted with Doug Gilmore and Steve Thomas. They now had Jason Arnott on the club, a trade from last season, and Robbie Fatorak took over as head coach. And to start the season, Dave looked like he found a scoring touch again with 10 points in 10 games, but injuries started to hit our hero, as he already missed one game early on in the season, but would miss five in November. He also missed 21 games between January 5th, when he got hurt, to his return on February 20th. He'd miss a total of 30 games all season. Upon his return, he went on a 13-game pointless streak, the longest since his rookie year, and was a minus six during that time. However, he broke it with back-to-back two-point games against the, the Ducks and the Penguins, the latter of which he had two goals. The Devils were again a 100-point club for the third straight year, finished first in the East for the third straight year as well, 47-24-11 for 105 points, and their goal production actually improved significantly. In the opening round, they were set to face the Pittsburgh Penguins, who were not the powerhouse they once were, but were still a very prominent contender. They, of course, were led by Yaramir Yager, the NHL's leader in scoring that year, Alexei Kovalev, Martin Straka. They had a defense led by Kevin Hatcher, and in net, a former teammate of Dave's, 16-year veteran, Tom Barrasso, who now has two Stanley Cup rings to his name. In Game 1, Peter Sakura scores two goals, and the Devils' defense and Roder play a dandy, and the Devils win it 3-1. In Game 2, it's looking bleak for the Penguins, as they'll be without Yager. However, Kovalev, Miller, and Straka in a big game from Barrasso give the Pens a 4-1 win. Davis, the only goal of the game for the Devils. Davis out for Game 3, and the Devils are looking like the same old song and dance yet again. Straka notches a hat-trick at the 4-2 win for the Pens. In Game 4, Dave returns. That means the Devils' defensive game gets a little stronger, and Barrasso is bombarded as well. Breland and McKay play very well, and Holy comes up huge with three assists, a 4-2 win. The series is tied heading into Game 5 back in the Garden State. Dave, however, is out yet again for Game 5, but Holy, McKay, and Iliash come up huge in a tight-knit 4-3 win, and they have the Penguins back up against the wall for Game 6. And in Game 6, the Pens get a boost. Yager is back with the Devils. Have a 2-1 lead late in the third period. But with 2-12 to go, Yager scores. And we're off to overtime. And it's Yager again. We're off to Game 7. Davis back for Game 7, but it's not looking good. And the Devils are down 3-1 after 2 period. But Dave scores to give the Devils a boost by the midway point. But they just can't catch up. Straka scores another. And the Broder gave up 4 goals on his 14 shots. A miserable game. And he caught fire from the New Jersey sports media. Once again, the Devils are out in the first round. Three straight 100-point seasons, the teams fail in all of them. And they only get to the second round once, and Dave didn't even play in the first round of that year. Now, Dave was fine in the four games he played with two goals and was even on the plus-minus way of things, but Devils GM Lou Lamorello was ready to make more changes after more playoff failure. In his 52 games he played, Dave had 15 goals and 13 assists for 28 points, a career low both in assists and points. And again, it was Bobby Holik, like, much like most of his tenure in New Jersey, he clicked with the most. Brian Rolston, however, he also gelled well with this season to boot, and Brendan Morrison. Dave, of course, missed 30 games due to injury. There honestly wasn't much to write home about here, as Dave's offensive production was uh, bound to be low on a team like the Devils, but now he just seemed to be another utility guy in this season. One of the changes Lamorella was about to make was not renewing Dave's contract. His time in New Jersey after four seasons, three of them full seasons, were done.
Dave's time in New Jersey saw him accomplish two major milestones. He had one excellent season with the club, but at 36 years old, he was about to enter his 18th season, and there was still one milestone he wanted more than any other, the Stanley Cup. Sadly, his last two seasons in New Jersey gave him his 10th career first-round playoff exit. In the summer of 1999, the Boston Bruins still saw value in Dave and signed him to a one-year deal, for the same reason any other team wanted him, to strengthen their power play. And the Bruins had a pretty good power play the year prior, and he was joining a team coached by a man he is indeed very familiar with. Pat Burns. The Bruins' defense was solid, and indeed, they needed more goals. And Dave, when healthy, can likely add anywhere between 20 and 30. The Bruins did have talented forwards, however, such as a guy named Joe Thornton, who had yet to find his full groove. They had a hard-working Anson Carter. They had Steve Hines, and their best scoring forward, Jason Allison. In goal, they had Byron Defoe, who had an incredible season the year prior. And their defense was pretty strong, made up of veteran Don Sweeney, Kyle McLaren, and Hal Gill. Oh, and yes, uh, going into his 21st season, yet still playing like he's a youngster, the great Ray Bork. This Bruins team seemed like it was going somewhere with Burnsy behind the bench, and he full well knew what Dave was capable of. The Bruins, however, got off to an awful start, and were winless in their first nine games, where Dave did have five points, it was a minus one. The Bruins were now rolling, however, as they found themselves going for their third win in a row in a game on the road against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And Dave scored the opening goal on the power play, set up from Bork. And then Ray put one in the net himself, and in 115 after that, Dave scores the second of the game. 22 seconds after that, Thornton puts the Bruins up 4 to nothing. By late in the second period, Tampa had started a comeback, but Dave scores a hat trick, the 12th of his career, his first since December 1st, 1993. He scores one more, a four-goal game. He's named the first star of the game. Dave looks like he's back to where he needed to be. And this continued on as the Bruins would go unbeaten in 14 of 17 games in that stretch. And Dave had 14 points in those games. But unfortunately, the Bruins would only win two of the next 15. And Dave had six points and was a minus six to boot. But this wasn't all down to him. The team was a disaster. There was a point, too, where Dave would go pointless in eight of nine games. And on March 6, 2000, a shocking trade took place. That would involve Dave, but as many know, he wasn't exactly the principal part of his trade. The Boston Bruins traded Dave and future Hall of Famer Ray Bork, who had spent all 21 of his NHL seasons in Boston, to the Colorado Avalanche. In exchange for Martin Grenier, Samuel Paulson, Dave's former Devils teammate Brian Rolson, and an option for a first-round draft pick in either 2000 or 2001. Either way, Bork may have been the big shock because he wanted to play for a contender, but now Dave gets that chance as well. The Bruins at the time of the trade were 19, 26, 17, and 4. Uh, yes, overtime losses are being counted now, with 59 points, and their playoff hopes fading. The Avalanche were 30, 26, 10, and 1 for 71 points. A good record, but not as good as a team of that caliber should be. They were slightly struggling in a few different ways. Dave Simon Boston saw him score 19 goals and 14 assists for 33 points in 63 games. And once again, much like his whole career, he just finds chemistry easily, with a hard-working acclaimed forward or a superstar, or both. And with Anson Carter, he found a lot of great chemistry. And their size up front clicked. He also clicked very well with Ray Bork and Steve Hines. Dave seemed to be doing slightly better in Boston than he was in his last days with the Devils, but it wasn't enough as the team as a whole was just in a heap of a mess. And good old Harry Sinnon making them moves, hey? Ha <laughs> ha. His time there would just last 64 games, but he did score his 12th and what would be his final hat trick of his career. Dave's time in Beantown is a blip on the radar screen of his career. Pretty much a trivia question on a hockey quiz night. Nothing more, nothing less. But there was hoping for another chance at the Cup now in Denver. The Avalanche, despite some recent struggles, were still one of the best teams on paper in the entire National Hockey League. And with Bork and Dave on their club, that certainly couldn't hurt their chances. They had the dynamic duo of Joe Sackick and Peter Forsberg, the latter of whom was having injury issues, however. They had the highly talented Milan Hayduk, Chris Drury, Alex Tangay, Adam Deadmarsh, a defense made of Sandy's Ozelinch, and Adam Foote, who Bork would now be joining. And in net, the great Patrick Waugh. They were coached by the uh, ever so popular... <laughs> Bob Hartley. Dave made his debut for the Avalanche on March 7, 2000 as the team was on a road trip out west, and in back-to-back -back wins over the Flames and the Oilers, Dave had an assist in each of those games. 
but it didn't seem Dave factored much into the team's plans. His ice time was very limited. His plus minus rating was plummeting further. There were other left wingers above him in the pecking order. He did get his first and only goal with the Avalanche and a win over the Oilers. Despite all this, Colorado went on a tear after this trade. 12-2-1, finishing the year 42-28-11-1 for 96 points. Third place in the West. Dave again is on a team that has a chance to win it all. In the first round awaiting the Avalanche were the Phoenix Coyotes. They were led by such stars as Keith Kachuk, Jeremy Roenick, and Shane Doan. On defense, you had veteran Teppo Newman, Yerky Lume, and Dave's former Devils teammate, Lyle Odeline. And in net, the awesome Sean Burke. Game 1 took place in Denver, and this night belonged to the Avalanche. Dave scored the second goal of the game, en route to the Avs taking a 4-0 lead. The Coyotes tried to make a game of it, but the Avs take it 6-3. Game 2, the Avalanche continued to roll, and so did Dave with an assist and a 3-1 win. The Avs are up two games headed to the desert. In Game 3, it was a tight-knit battle, tied at 2-2 after Ronick scored a tie-it in the third period. But 29 seconds later, Denmark scored, and then scored another. That one being an empty netter, a 4-2 win on the verge of a sweep. A game four, however, the Coyotes weren't giving up despite the odds being stopped against them. They took a 3-0 lead, but Dave broke the shutout and Denmark would score late in the third period. However, it was too late and the sheer series just back to Denver. And it's a tight-knit defensive game, but the Avs hold on. After Peter Forsberg scores the game winner early in the third period to win it 2-1 and take the series four games to one. While Dave was part of a 97 Devils team who won the first round match, he didn't play in that series. So this was technically his first series win since 1994 with the Toronto Maple Leafs, and he played pretty well. Three points in five games. Next up awaiting the Avs was their heated rivals, the Detroit Red Wings, who were only just a few years removed from being a Stanley Cup champion. However, they still had that great talented core. Steve Eiserman, Sergei Fedorov, Shanny Lidstrom, Chris Osgood in net. This team was still stacked and still coached by Scotty Bowman. Game 1 in Denver saw Patrick Waugh acquire a shutout in a very close 2-0 win for Colorado. It's not a close game in Game 2 as Juan Osgood put on a goaltending spectacle, but the Avalanche win again and the Avs stay undefeated at home in these playoffs with a two-game lead headed to Detroit for the next two games. Detroit, however, took Game 3 after a big night from Nick Lidstrom and the Wings take it 3-1 and cut Colorado's lead down to 2-1 in the series. In Game 4, the Wings held a 2-1 lead as the third period was ticking down. All those big stars were getting shut down, but with 4.27 to go, Sackick to Hayduk to Dave! The game is tied, and we're going to OT. Just over the halfway point of overtime, Chris Drury scores, and the Avalanche had the Wings on the verge of elimination. The Avalanche maintained simple control in Game 5, back at home, took a 2-0 lead and never looked back in a 4-2 win winning the series in five games. Dave only had one goal, but it was a biggie, as he was key also in maintaining many of the de big Detroit stars who were shut down in certain games. For the third time in his career and first time since 1994, Dave was about to play in a conference final series and awaiting the Avalanche with the defending Stanley Cup champion, Dallas Stars, who had eliminated the Avalanche in a seven-game series in the conference finals a year prior. The team was stacked to the gills. Future Hall of Famers Mike Modano, Red Hall, Joe Neuendijk, a tremendous group of defensive forwards yet by Yuri Lettinen, another Hall of Famer and Key Carbono, Kirk Muller, and Mike Keane. A defense led by another future Hall of Famer, Sergei Zubov, along with Daryl Sador and team captain, Darian Hatcher. And in goal, <laughs> you guessed it, another Hall of Famer, Ed Belfour. Game 1 in Dallas, both teams and defenses are putting it all out there. And the only two goals were scored in the second period by Colorado. Dave assisting on one of them, the Avs take a 2-0 win. In Game 2, a very competitive close game, but... But it's the Stars who avoid losing two games at home with a 3-2 win. The series shifts to Colorado for the next two games, and the Avs fire on Belfort constantly, who stands on his head. But it's Wah who gets his second shutout of the series, another 2-0 win for the Avs, and a 2-1 lead in the series. In Game 4, however, Brett Hull went to work, and the Stars were on fire. And the Avs lose their first playoff game at home this postseason, tying the series at 2. Back in Dallas for Game 5, another exciting, tight game. Tied at 2 under regulations, we're off to OT in the extra frame. However, Joe Neuendijk stores, and the Avs on the verge of elimination. For Game 6 back in Denver, after a scoreless first period, Bork and Hull exchange goals in the second. And it stays that way for a while, by late in the third period, it looked like we are going to another overtime game. But with 3.51 to go, Drury scores, the Avs hang on a win, we are going to Game 7. 
And indeed, the deciding game in Dallas, it does not look good. The Azure are down 3-0 after two periods. But Forsberg scores a shorthanded goal. It was still over 11 minutes to play. Hayduk scores, and the lead is cut to 3-2. The Avs still have a chance. So many chances, so many opportunities, but they just can't capitalize. Dave, he's hustling out there, trying hard to keep from losing yet another playoff series. But the clock winds down, and Dallas wins, and they're going back to the finals. Dave sadly didn't factor too much in this series. And to boot, not only did he miss a chance at the finals again, but the Stars did lose to the New Jersey Devils. Ouch. Dave only scored a goal and two assists during the regular season for the Avalanche. His goal was assisted by Sakak and Bork, and both assists were to Adam Deadmarsh. And collaborations on both were from Peter Forsberg. And I thought his time in Boston was a trivia question. But so it is brief tenure in Denver. While he finally made a deep playoff run for the first time in six seasons, he once again had a team that falls short. David already achieved 500 goals and 1,000 career points, but this season saw him approaching another milestone. His presence on the power play was paying dividends throughout his career, because by the end of the 1999-2000 season, he was ranked 5th all-time in power play goals scored. The only other active member on the list was Brett Hull. But since Brett was still a top tier forward in the NHL at this point, and Dave's stats were dwindling, nobody was sure if he could approach the record. It was a crazy zany year for Dave, spending time with two new franchises. He seemed to be having a pretty decent season on a lowly Bruins club, and joined the Avalanche team where he just didn't seem to fit their mold of what they wanted. He also finished a career low, minus 20 all season. But be that as it may, he scored his 12th career hat trick, and made it to the conference finals again, so close, yet so far out of reach. Colorado didn't sign Dave to a new deal, and that was pretty much a good guess that wouldn't happen. And once again, he was journeying elsewhere. And teams did want him, however. There's even an unconfirmed rumor that the Minnesota Wild, who would be an expansion team entering the league in 2000-2001, who were, were coached by Jacques Lemaire, had quite a big interest in Dave due to Lemaire having success with him in New Jersey. But his destination would be an interesting one, and well, we'll get to that in a second. So in the offseason in 2000, Dave was exploring his options. And while his value as a goal scorer may be diminishing, I don't want to be misquoted here. His value as a player was still very much a huge factor. Still very much gave him immense redeeming value. He had veteran leadership. He could still bring size to the game and was a solid defensive forward to boot. But it dropped a few jaws where he would decide to go next. He was going back to where it all began. Yes. The Buffalo Sabres. Mind you, things had changed, however, quite a bit in the seven years Dave had gone. The Sabres had actually built a contender on the back of their megastar goaltender, the Dominator Dominic Hasek, who at this point had won the Vezina Trophy five times in seven seasons. Not to mention, he also won the Hart Trophy as league MVP twice. On defense, name a few, they had Alexei Zidnik, Jason Woolley, and veteran Jason Patrick. Up front, they were led by Miro Jatan and other reliable forwards such as Stu Barnes, J.P. Dumont, Chris Gratton, and Doug Gilmore. The team was coached by Dave's former teammate at Taboot, Lindy Ruff. Goals were against were not a huge issue for the Buffalo Sabres, as they did, however, again, lack scoring, and Dave was brought in to help, as they figured another 20-goal scorer and power play master can hurt. The Sabres team, however, was in uncertainty. They just lost team captain and probably their best all-around player up front in Mike Pekka. And they were just slightly removed from a Stanley Cup appearance in 1999, where they lost to the Dallas Stars. Dave was welcomed back with open arms as he received a huge ovation as he skated out for his first game back in a Sabres uniform since 1993 as they played a home game in a win over the Los Angeles Kings where Dave scored a goal. The Sabres would go on a five-game winless streak, but bounce back, going unbeaten in nine of their next ten. And Dave was doing fairly well as a goal scorer, but still providing some good defensive presence as well. He had eight points in that stretch. Dave would go on a ten-game scoreless drought in December, but he was still actively working hard to help the Sabres team win. And they were doing amazing. Dave was helping them improve on their power play to boot. And he had two three-point nights later in the season. One on the road against the Rangers, and one at home against the Tampa Bay Lightning. He was the first star in both games. 
The Sabres finished 46-30, 5-1 for 98 points. But he had a stacked Eastern Conference that was only good enough for 5th place. Still very good, however. But Hasek was the one who was unstoppable. The Sabres had the least amount of goals scored on them in the entire NHL. How glorious this would be for Dave to come back to where it all began and win his first Stanley Cup doing so in Buffalo. In the opening round, the Sabres were ready for a Philadelphia Fire squad. A team full of perseverance and tenacity, marred with injuries, they still maintained a great record. They made a big coaching change, hiring Hall of Famer Bill Barber. And without Eric Lindros all season, John LeClaire missing 66 games, the Flyers still bolstered a great lineup of Mark Recchi, Eric Desjardins, Keith Primo, young Simon Gagné, Dan McGillis, Damon Lankow, and Annette Roman Chikmanek. The Flyers were among the league leaders with man games missed, but still were a 100-point club. Game 1 in Philly, Chikmanek and Hasek put on a show, but all goals were scored in the first period. Gilmore scores the winner, and the Sabres take Game 1 in Philly. Game 2 was a back and forth affair which resulted in being tied in 3-3 at the end of regulation. And as the first overtime was winding down with 158 to go, Jay McKee scores and Buffalo takes both games in Philly. Game 3 in Buffalo, the fans were going wild, but with the game tied 2-2 after 2, Andy Delmore scores with under 9 minutes to play, the Flyers stay in the series and win. Game 4 still in Buffalo, the Sabres lead 2-0 at one point, but it was 3-3 by the end of regulation and overtime, Curtis Brown scores and they have the Flyers on the verge of elimination. In Game 5, however, back in Philly, the Flyers stay alive with a very focused effort and a 3-1 win, staving off elimination. However, in Game 6, back in Buffalo, the Flyers were embarrassed. Dave assisted on the first two goals. Donald Audette scores. Then it's Dave on the power play. A 3-point night and what would be an 8-0 thrashing as the Sabres take the series in six games. Dave's presence was limited in most games, but he came alive in that Game 6. As the story made for Hollywood was one step closer to a fruition. Now awaiting them in the second round is the Pittsburgh Penguins, who Dave encountered just two years prior while playing with the Devils. And they're still a talented bunch. They still had Yager, Kovalev, Straka, Lang, Kasparitis. In net, they had J.S. Oban and Gar Snow. And they saw a huge return, Kevin Stevens! Oh, wait, and that Mario Lemieux guy came back too after three years of retirement. And they finished two points behind the Sabres in the standings. Game one took place, but this time in net, it was Johan Hedberg starting for the Penguins. He shut the Sabres out, and the Pens looked sharp in a 3 0 win to open the series. Game two, Hedberg still played well, and Hasek played a not so good game. The Pens take it 3 1. The Sabres lose both games in Buffalo. However, for game three in Pittsburgh's Buffalo roars back with big games from James Patrick, Maxim Fenneganoff, I love saying that name, and Jason Woolley, a 4 1 win. In Game 4, the Sabres saw a huge three-point outing from Stu Bars, as well as a tight game from their defense, giving Hasek a lot of room, and the Sabres dominate 5-2 to tie this series. It's been an all-road series so far, but back in Buffalo for Game 5, the Pens take a 2-0 lead. But it's tied by the third period, and we're off to overtime, and it's Stu Barnes continuing to play very well. 8-34 in, the Sabres have taken a 3-2 series lead and are on the verge of returning to the conference finals for the first time in two years. In Game 6, the Sabres had the hands up against the wall. The 2-1 in the third period, very late. But with 1.18 left, Mario scores, and we're off to overtime again. And 11.29 in, Straka scores and forces a Game 7 back in Buffalo. And we're set for a thrilling and deciding game in Buffalo. It's tied 2-2 over the third straight game. We're going into OT, and it's Kasparitis, of all people, sinking Buffalo's season. Dave was sadly a non-factor for much like he was in many games for the Avalanche in the playoffs with no points and a minus one. To top it off, Dave's former team, the Devils, went back to the Stanley Cup again. But they'd lose to the Colorado Avalanche. Double ouch. Dave scored 20 goals and 13 assists this season for 33 points and collaborated with many teammates in his point total. Between the likes of Rob Ray, Chris Gratton, Jason Woolley, Miro Chatan, Eric Rasmussen, and a familiar face, Doug Gilmore. It seemed as though every team he was going to was trying to play to whatever strength they could with him in the neutral zone trap era. But nobody was able to use it quite like the Devils did in that era. Despite this, he helped the Sabres improve their power play, but didn't get the right as happy ending where it all began. Dave still moved up the all-time power play goals list with 236 as he passed Marcel Dion, but so did Brett Hall. And the two were now literally neck and neck tied for second all-time, both closing in on Phil Esposito. However, Dave was also ranked high in a dubious record. 
As going into the 2000-2001 season, Ray Bork was the leader in most games played without a Stanley Cup win. But obviously finally winning one with the Avalanche, that record was now off the books. And Dave is now ranked number four, behind three Hall of Famers no less. One of them being Leafs teammate Mike Gartner, showing it can happen to anyone. And his former teammate for eight years in Buffalo, Phil Housley, is just six games behind him and was still active as well as a member of the Calgary Flames. However, Housley had at least made a Stanley Cup appearance when he played for the Washington Capitals in the 97-98 season. So Dave left Buffalo again, this time for good, and was about to enter his 20th NHL season. And again, teams were looking at him, still feeling he had a lot to provide, and he did. But... Was he going to sign up with a contender? After all, even contending teams could use his abilities on the ice. But what team could use his leadership qualities, guidance, mentoring of young players, while still adding those 20 or so goals he's always reliable for? So in the offseason, yes indeed, he could have probably courted some contenders. But he would sign with the lowly and somewhat pathetic Tampa Bay Lightning. And that brings an end to part two of our series, as next week we will look at his days his final hockey days in Tampa Bay. Are there any other players you'd like to see me cover? Leave a comment below. Also hit like, hit subscribe, and please share this video if you know any indie fans out there. Until next time, I'll see ya.